Hello everybody, Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is going to be a little bit on uh, Passover. We're going to do a little, just a little bit on Easter, which most churches will try to convince you that was the resurrection. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was a week when people were not to eat any bread that had leaven in it. Now, I am going to put in the description box a bunch of different videos that I've done in years past on Passover. And I'm just going to briefly cover a little bit about Passover, but mostly this is probably should be about unleavened bread, but as the Lord provides the Good Shepherd, right? All right, let's take a look and we'll, uh, well, let's take a look. This might end up being a multi-part series. Uh, you know, it's hard to skip around things. I have to assume that uh, some of you listeners are very, very well versed. Matter of fact, a lot of you in subjects know more than I do. But uh, I have to assume that, you know, somebody is a new, fairly new listener, uh, that they haven't listened to my 800 and something studies that I've been doing over the last 10 years or so. And uh, that maybe or perhaps they're new to the faith. And... Uh, you know, they don't know a lot of the background. And I feel kind of bad, uh, you know, long-winded, but uh, I like making sure that I cover the background lest people accuse me of taking verses out of context. So let's go to, let's go to the beginning, Genesis chapter 3, the fall of mankind. Verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Yea, I'm sorry, uh, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, who's this serpent? Now, if you use the Bible to interpret the Bible, and it only works with the King James uh, that I know of, perhaps the uh, Geneva Bible does the same. I don't know. Um, I trust the Geneva Bible, and, but I've gotten used to using the King James because that's the most popular one. So let's use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where? Heaven. That old serpent. That old serpent. Think Genesis. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And that's you and that's me. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Wow, Satan's got angels. Who'd have thunk? All right, uh... Verse 2, Genesis 3, verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, Oh, I'm, for, I'm sorry. Verse 3. Uh, well, all right, verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. You know, there's a reason why uh, Satan's called the father of lies because this is the first thing he did that's recorded in the Bible. He lied. Verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, guess what? Satan's basically in his subtle way is saying, you know what? God's holding you back. He's He's keeping, he's oppressing you. He's keeping you down. Cast off those chains. Break down that wall. Verse 6. 
And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The fig tree was a symbol of Judah in the Bible. Judah was the tribe of the kings. The Levi and the Levites were the priest tribe. So the king was the civil government, which is sort of like our police and court system. And, uh, and then the Levites were, you know, the religious leaders, which by the time of Christ, they were thoroughly corrupted. All right, so they, uh, verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Yeah, God's asking a question. Where are you? Like he didn't already know the answer, right? And he said, Adam, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he, God, and he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? <laughs> you know, God already knows the answer. He's just going to see, uh, how are you going to answer me? Huh? 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 You going to tell me the truth, or you going to... You're going to spin a big one, like the, uh, the nightly news does. They like to spin big ones, right? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Oh yeah, God, it's your fault. You know that woman that you gave me? Uh-huh. It, it, it's your fault because you gave me that woman and she's the one that did it. Yeah, that, that's, that's the... Uh, Adam translation there. Verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Oh yeah, it's, it's the serpent's fault. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity, that's hatred, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Huh. Now God's talking to the serpent here. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And we still have that today. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And anybody that's done gardening knows about thistles and uh, thorns. All right. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Now this is very significant. Evidently, uh, this was probably the first Passover. I don't know if it was the same date. It's very possible it is. I mean, the Bible doesn't say yes, it doesn't say no. Um, I'm just kind of speculating. 
but um, did, you know, up to this point, there was no sin in the world. Um, Adam and Eve would have probably lived forever. And uh, maybe the animals live forever. I don't know. But evidently, I mean, I'm reading between the lines here, but it looks like God took and killed an animal, maybe a lamb, and made them coats of skins to clothe them. Unto Adam also and his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. So, can you imagine the horror on Adam and Eve's face? They've never seen death before, and God takes an animal and kills it, and then skins it, and then makes some clothing out of it to cover their sin. Ew. You know, I've seen animals uh, butchered. I, it's not something I'm thrilled to see, but, uh, you know, could this have been the first Passover? I don't know. But it is representative of it, in my opinion. And if you disagree, that's fine, because, you know, the Bible does not go into that much detail. But uh, the Old Testament's always a shadow of things to come in the New. All right, so verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to, take, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove, drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. All right. All right, everybody. Listen, um, I think we're going to... Okay, go to Exodus chapter 12. I have an entire series on a playlist. On uh, if you go to if you click on my name on my channel, it'll take you to the home page. You go to the towards the top of the page and it'll say playlist. Click on that and you'll find an entire series on uh, the plagues that the Lord did under uh, with Moses. The plagues of Egypt, and I'm sure most of you have probably watched the Ten Commandments with uh, Charlton Heston. Uh, was that a Cecil B. DeMille movie? Uh, you know what? I, I found out recently that um, the woman that played Moses' wife in that movie was, uh, I think her name was Bevel, Beverly DiCarlo, probably of the tribe. Uh, but... Uh, she played Lily Munster, Herman Munster's wife in the Munst, uh, the Munsters. And um, when I was looking up her uh, thing, because I didn't know that was her, when I was looking up that thing, I noticed in the fifties. I think it was in the fifties. She was. Uh, she did a um, a photo shoot where she was wearing. It wasn't a. It was not a uh, bikini. It was more of a like a lingerie shot. All she's wearing is like a bra and underwear. And it was uh, black with uh, what looked like spider webs. You know, I was like, whoa. You know, that was pretty racy for back in the 50s. But then again, you know, 19, I think it was 1956, Hugh Hefner came out with uh, Playboy. I think. I think it was 56. Um and uh, so, you know, Hollywood, they've been promoting this stuff for a long, long time, you know. And uh, so, yeah, she was a Lily Munster. But The Ten Commandments was terrible as a movie. I mean, just absolutely terrible. Um, they don't follow, it didn't follow the Bible at all. But, uh, you know, the plagues give you the general idea. Uh, but I did a, a, a contrast of how the plagues of Egypt are in some ways similar to the plagues of Revelation. So if you want to take a look at the playlist and take a look at it, you can. But um, 
So, all right, let's read Exodus chapter 12. Uh, we're getting ready to do the, uh, the Passover. And I'm just going to barely, you know, try to cover the Passover a little bit. But then we're going to do, do the unleavened bread. Now, there are people that will tell you that Passover is now. And then there's people that will say it's uh, 14 days after the, the uh, spring equinox, which the equinox is where the daylight and the nighttime are both of approximately equal length. Matter of fact, let's take a look at something like that. Now, something I found interesting was in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 15, uh, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called light. And what is darkness? Darkness is just the absence of light. So, and the darkness he called light, and the evening and the morning were, were the first day. Do you know that the new day starts when the sun goes down, according to the Bible? It's darkness and then light. Evening and then morning. So when the sun goes down at approximately 6 or 7 o'clock, um, that's the start of the new day, according to the Bible. As a matter of fact, the spring is the beginning of the year according to the Bible. So here it is, you know, in the Western world, we got the, the start of the day is midnight. Where did they come up with that? Uh, well, in the book of Daniel, it talks about um, he would change times and laws. And then... When is the um, start of the new year? December 31st, January 1st, the middle of winter, right? So, why is it significant evening, darkness, and then the morning, light, the first day? Well, guess what? Evil and wickedness is likened unto darkness, and then when Christ's kingdom comes, the light of the world, well, then we're, the kingdom of darkness shall be transformed into light. But as of right now, we are in darkness. But eventually, when Christ gets tired of all this wickedness and comes to reclaim his kingdom, well, we'll be in the kingdom of light. But until then, we got to do what we got to do. So, I hope I made that um, clear. Right now, we're in darkness, and one day we'll be in the light. His light. Not our light, but His light. All right, let's go to Exodus chapter 12. Now, like I said, I don't want to make this a 20-hour study, and I could if I wanted to, but... Uh, God had, uh, you know, there, the plagues of Egypt. And it follows pretty similar to the uh, plagues in the end times in the book of Revelation. So that's a worthy playlist if you want to take a look at it. Uh, all right, so Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. The beginning of the year, people. Spring. It shall be the first month of the year for uh, to you. Now, I'm going to admit, I don't know. I don't know if, if this time, uh, it's April 10. I don't know if this is uh, really Passover or if Passover comes on the spring equinox. I don't know. I, I, some people set the dates by the moon. Uh, the moon is, uh, I think it's, what is it, 29 and three quarters of a day to go around. I don't remember. But the year is 365 and a quarter days. 
That's why every fourth year there's a leap day. Because in a perfect circle, um, a perfect circle would be 360 degrees. But the Earth is not doing a perfect circle around the Sun. If my information is correct. Of course, the government, NASA, lies about everything. So, you know, who knows? The Lord knows. But who knows among us, you know, lowly sheep? All right, so, verse 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, I was wrong, the tenth day, not the fourteenth, uh, they shall take to them every man a lamb. Remember, God took uh, coat uh, skins uh, of animals, of coats, and made them clothes. Oh, yeah. Uh, they shall take of them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Verse 4. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Now, here's very important. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Ah. See, this is pointing to Christ. A male, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Boy, we got a lot of goats. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. Ah, there's the 14th day. Two weeks. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood. Ah. I think I'm going to have to stop here and do some New Testament references. And they shall take, the, take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses when they shall eat it. All right, let's take a look. All right, John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John, John the Baptist, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. All right, Romans 5, 9. Well, let's take a look at the verse in context. Romans 5, verse 7. For, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. Very important. Christ shed his blood on the cross, right? Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from, from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, at the Passover dinner, in Mark 14, 24, And he, Jesus, and he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, many. Now, if you want to go into more detail about uh, Passover, as opposed to Easter, um, I put a bunch of links to the other uh, videos because I've covered that fairly in detail in times past. So, all right, uh, let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. All right, so verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire. 
Roast with fire. Ah. Now, why fire? Well, remember, in um, Genesis chapter 6, uh, God promised Noah that he would no more destroy the entire world with the flood. However, next time it's going to be fire. I believe I did an entire, yeah, I did an entire series on fire. You know, when you got over 800 and something videos that you've done over the last 10 years, it's hard to remember them all. All right, Matthew 3.11. John the Baptist speaking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Matthew 3.12 Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up, his, uh, burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Matthew 13.40 and Jesus speaking, As therefore the tares, the weeds, are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Oh boy, it ain't going to be good for them. Um, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. All right, so they had to take a lamb without blemish, kill it, take the blood and put it on the doors of their house. And then whatever they didn't, they had to roast it with fire. Significant, huh? Um, let's see. All right, back to Exodus chapter 12. 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. Now remember, leaven is always likened unto sin in the Bible. Always. Um, I can't find a place where leaven is not likened unto sin in the Bible. If anybody can show me otherwise, I would appreciate it. Uh, let's see. And unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Why bitter herbs? To remind you of the bitterness of the hard bondage of the work, the uh, slavery work they were doing in Egypt, right? Um, now, eat the flesh, right? All right, John chapter 6 and verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. What? We got to be cannibals and vampires? What? Yeah, that's what most of the people were thinking. Well, we going to... We're going to be cannibals and vampires? What? Jesus, I, th this guy, he's he, he sounds like he's off his rocker here, is what the majority of people would be saying, right? Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Wait a minute, I, well, you're going to raise him up on the last day, but I thought we were going to be raised up at the pre-trib rapture. And then we still got seven years of the tribulation. Oh boy, oh, I guess this is, uh, some people will tell you that this is a mistake. Hmm. Verse 55. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. 
He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of the disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. Judas Iscariot, anyone? And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Did you catch that? No man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And there are Baptist churches that call themselves free will Baptist churches that'll tell you that you're the one that makes the choice, not the Lord. But here, Jesus says that no man can come unto him except it were given unto him of my Father. So, which is it? Do we make the choice or does God make the choice? Well, maybe God makes the choice and then we have to make the choice whether or not we'll accept the offer. I don't know. Now, here's, this, is, this is a wonderful verse right here. Remember, Jesus said you had to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. John chapter 6 and verse 66. John 6, 6, 6. Did you catch that? John 6, 6, 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. <laughs> Isn't that appropriate, John 666? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Jesus, Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. All right, in Mark 14, verse 22, this is the, uh, the Last Supper. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank it all. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. All right, we're going to take a look at, um, this is the Passover, the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and the blood. But um, people will try to convince you that Christ rose on Easter. Now, unless Easter is three days and three nights after Passover? I don't believe it. And I have only seen Easter three days and three nights after what some people say is Passover one time in my life, and it was like a year or two ago. I don't know. I'm not a 
a trained Levitical priest. I mean, those people were uh, trained from their youth up. I'm just some guy that, you know, would rather read the Bible than watch television. I'm by no means am I a scholar. And I don't claim to be, I don't claim to be a prophet. I'm just, I'm just some schmo that, you know, teaches because there's very few teachers out there that want to teach what they feel is the truth. You know, most, most of your pastors are hirelings and, and I'm not one of them. And, uh, and to the one that sent me a hundred bucks today, thank you. It's been a long time since I've gotten a present in the mail. Thank you very much. You know who you are. Much appreciated since I spent uh, almost $300 today. All right, let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. All right, so. And they shall take of the blood, verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and of the upper door posts of the house, wherein they shall eat it. Exodus 12 and verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. Now that uh, Bible series that I did, the playlist, on the plagues of Egypt as opposed to the plagues of in Revelation. All those plagues were um, directed to the gods of Egypt. Yeah, Egypt had a bunch of different gods. They had the frog god. They had the, the god of the Nile. Um, they had, uh, oh, Beelzebub, the lord of the flies. Remember they had the, the flies in Egypt? Um you know, they, this was, the Lord God was sending a challenge to the gods of Egypt. Believe it or not, that's what it was all about. Uh, let's see. And I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. All right, verse 13. Exodus 12 and 13. And the blood shall be to you, the blood, for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over, ah, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. People contrast that with the time of the Great Tribulation. Those that have the blood of the Lamb, they're not going to be touched. But those that don't have the blood of the Lamb, big trouble. You know, the Old Testament is well worth reading. I, you know, I, I've had, uh, I moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, just to be with this one pastor that I thought was on the up and up. Boy, I tell you what, every time I go move somewhere to be with somebody I think is on the up and up. It ends up being a disaster. See, every time, every stinking time, boy, that guy was, uh, he was another one of them. But uh, he actually told me, well, you know, don't read that Old Testament. That was for the Jews and, and we're not Jews. And that's almost basically what he told me. I was like, what? Don't read the Old Testament? No, we're New Testament Christians. Don't read that Old Testament. I'm like, what? Ugh. You know, people, I, I, 
I don't, I don't want to teach. I, I'm afraid to teach. I know that every word that I put out, I'm going to have to give an account to the Lord one day. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to have to give an account. But, uh, you know, that's the thing. There are so few teachers that are, you know, teaching what I feel would be truth that I just felt convicted, you know. I know I'm not no great speaker or nothing, you know. I'm just, I'm just some schmo that spends a lot of time in the Bible, that's all. Or has in the past, so. Uh, all right, so. Verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. Ah, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. That's a good idea. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Huh, how long's forever? Hmm. Do you know in the kingdom we're going to keep the, uh, the uh, tabernacles? It's in my uh, Zechariah series. I think it's in Zechariah 14, if I remember correctly. You know, it's hard to remember. The Bible is three quarters of a million words, 750,000 something words. It's hard to remember where everything is, you know. I've got a fairly decent memory, but uh, I don't have a photographic memory. So, verse 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Why is that? We'll get back to that. Seven days ye shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. Yeah, you were supposed to go through the house and get rid of all the leaven in your house. Now, spiritually, spiritual application, okay? Here was the physical application. Every year, God wanted us to take an account, look, our, look at ourselves in the mirror, spiritually speaking, and get rid of all the leaven, the sin in our lives. That's the spiritual application. But this was a shadow of things to come. Every year, they would go through the house and get rid of all the leaven. And I'm going to cover that in more detail. Maybe not in this Bible study. It's already uh, almost 45 minutes. And I haven't even started on the, uh, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I haven't even started. I'm just laying the groundwork. All right, so. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away all uh, leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. See, God, it was pretty serious stuff to him. Get rid of that leaven. Don't be eating that leavened bread. Remember uh, the Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Oh, yeah. When you got a person in church that's sinning openly and the pastor won't do anything about it. I mean, there's a lot of people in the church that'll just say, well, he doesn't care about that, so why should he care about this? You know, that's the thing. All right. And in the first day, there shall be an holy convocation. And in the seventh day, there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And I believe that's, uh, you're allowed to, to make food, and that's about it. That's how I look at it. I could be wrong. I don't claim to know all this stuff. I'm not a trained Levitical priest that spent, you know, 15, 20 years learning this stuff. Um, verse 17. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies. Have I brought your armies 
Did you know that Israel was to be an army? I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Ah. Verse 18. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at even, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month, at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Now, when I was in college, one thing that uh, I always learned was when the teacher repeated something more than once, that was important, It'd usually be on the test. Well, this is the second time. Verse 20, ye shall eat nothing leavened. This is the third time. Ye shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. Sounds like the coronavirus, huh? Stay home. Yeah, you don't want to be out there when the Lord sends his uh, death angel, right? Uh, verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood, and when he seeth the blood upon the lentil and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the house and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Uh, all you naval people, we're not talking about a ship here. That's a joke. I know. Keep don't don't quit my day job. Oh, I don't have a day job. I'm retired. Ha ha ha. For however long the money is going to last. Um, sure, with this economy going crazy and crashing, uh, maybe none of us will have retirement by the time the uh, government's done with us. You know. I have a feeling the uh, the treatment for the coronavirus is going to be worse. The cure is going to be worse than the disease. All right. Uh, and will not suffer the destroyer to come in under your houses to smite you. And ye'll ob ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he has promised that ye shall keep this service and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you what mean ye by this service you know when you're doing the passover and they say what's the meaning of this verse 27 tells you the answer then ye shall say it is the sacrifice of the lord's passover who passed over the houses of the children of israel in egypt when he smote the egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And so did they. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go, and go, serve the Lord as ye have said, and take your flocks and your herds as ye have said, and be gone. Get the heck out of here. Hit the road, Jack. That's the Bob translation. And be gone and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed, borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, 
which is clothing. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things that they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, and 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. So there were 600,000 men on foot, not even including the children, not including the women. And a mixed multitude, a mixed multitude, what is that? That's probably non-Israelites. That's how I look at it. I don't know. I could be wrong. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough. Now, unleavened cakes of the dough is basically like crackers. Um, you can make that very fast. Uh, to bake bread, you have to wait for it to rise, and it takes longer. Uh, unleavened bread, you can make it very quick. You know, they were leaving in haste. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened. Neither they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither... Oh, I'm sorry, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual uh, food. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Um, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A, a foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. You know, in the Bible it said that, uh, not. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but it said that a not a bone of Christ would be broken. You see, the New Testament is a shadow of the new. The Old Testament is a shadow of the new. All right. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Uh, let's see. All right. So, why did the Lord have them leave Egypt? <clears throat> well, the Lord was trying to take Israel out of Egypt but in that 400 and something years, the Lord was trying to get Egypt out of the children of Israel. See, those Israel was totally steeped in the Egyptians' false worshiping. Now, in Luke 17:29. But the same day that Lot went out from Sodom, Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed. All right, let's try that again. Luke 17, 29. But the same day that Lot went out of Egypt, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. 2 Peter 2, 6. In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Jude 1, seven. even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, why in the world am I going here? Very simple. Revelation chapter 11. Let's read the whole thing. Verse 1. Well, not the whole thing. Verse 1. 
And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, same word as nations, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they trod underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. I did a Bible study on that. One of them is definitely going to be Elijah. Um, some people say the second one will be Moses. The other people say it'll be Enoch. I don't know. We'll find out. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now, that's about three and a half years. This is about the middle of the tribulation. Um, from what I understand, they will, when they appear, now the false prophet and the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet, uh, when they appear, from what I gather, and I don't claim to know it all, by no means, I believe these two witnesses will come and oppose them for about three and a half years. And then in the middle of the, tribu the, middle of the tribulation, approximately, uh, this is what we're going to be reading now. This is when this event, what I'm reading now, is going to happen. Verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses that they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. That's about 42 months, three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded, proceedeth out of their mouth. No, their mouths are not going to be flamethrowers. At least I don't think so. But uh, in the book, uh, I did an hour and 40 minute study on Elijah the prophet, where I cover some of this information, where Elijah called down fire, using his mouth, called down fire from heaven and destroyed some soldiers that were trying to arrest him. That's what I think, you know. Uh, but if you're interested, you know, and you want to see where the uh, exact study is, maybe I'll put it in the description. You can look. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven. Just like Elijah did in the book of Kings, Ahab and Jezebel, the wicked rulers, kings, and queen of Israel, northern Israel, not Judah. Elijah uh, withstood them and shut heaven up for like, I think it was three and a half years or three years. I don't know, something like that. Uh, verse 6, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood. Isn't that what happened in Egypt? Oh, yeah. To have power to over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And here's the punchline. And their dead bodies, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, all these people will tell you that this great city is Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. Well, what's the name of their Lord? Because as far as I know, Jesus was not crucified in Rome. In the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, people, not Rome. And of course, they'll argue, well, it was the Romans. Well, that's not what Paul says. Paul does not lay the crucifixion at the feet of the Romans. He lays it at the feet of the you-know-whos and... Um, starts with a J and it rhymes with news. Yeah. 
Verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three, and a, three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another. Sounds like Christmas, huh? Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Oh yeah, there will be people saved in the tribulation. So, all right, this is going to be the end of part one of the, well, maybe not. Let's take a look at one more thing. All right, now, um, there are people that will tell you that Easter is a satanic holiday given to us by the Roman Catholic Church. Well, is that true? Partly. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 8, verse, cha uh, chapter 8, verse 14. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet, and he's showing... The Lord is showing him that he's not happy with Israel. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Uh, Tammuz's mother was named Ishtar, Easter. Think about that. Easter was the goddess of spring. That's why you got bunny rabbits and Easter eggs. Fertility goddess. Verse 15. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they worshipped the sun toward the east. You see, they were having Easter sunrise services even back in the Old Testament days, long before the Roman Catholic Church ever existed. 17. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. Oh yeah, let's let's make the God of heaven and earth angry. All right, get the point? All right, this is the end of part one. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. In his precious name we pray, amen. Part two coming. Have, stay safe, people.